Um, welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to the United States Institute of Peace. My name, believe it or not, is Sheldon Himmelfarb, um, and I head USIP's Center of Innovation for Science, Technology, and Peace Building that's hosting today's session in partnership with really some terrific co-sponsors. Let me name them. James Eberhardt and Mobile Accord, Nick Martin and Tech Change, uh, the UN-mandated University of Peace, and the National Defense University. We also want to thank our online partners for the event who are helping to kind of promote the live webcast so folks who couldn't be here physically can still participate, and I'll explain that in a minute. We've got Development Seed, ElectionGuide.org, Frontline SMS, Georgetown University Center for Democracy and Civil Society, Civil Society Peace and Collaborative Development Network, the World Bank, they've all been promoting this online with their networks. Um, we are, as I say, broadcasting a live video stream of the entire event at USIP.org and a Twitter thread whose hashtag is USIP Mobile. So throughout the morning, let me just say I'm going to be going to um, Anand Varghese of our staff, who is going to be online uh, throughout, and he's going to convey to us what folks are saying uh, on Twitter and in the chat, and he'll be also relaying to us the online questions for the panelists that are coming in from all over the place. And so uh, if you're watching the webcast and you want to know, we want you to know that you really are a core part of this event. So go ahead and make your views and your questions known. We're going to try our very, very best to get them up here to the front of the room to the panelists. Now, having gathered everybody here to talk about cell phones, let me ask you to turn them off. Um, or at least set them on stun mode uh, or silent. And besides, the discussion that's going on in this room is going to be a lot more interesting, a lot more important, because we have a raid around this table, um, around this U at the front of the room, some of the world's leading innovators on the use of mobile phones in difficult environments. I'm going to talk about each one of these people. I'll talk about them, and my co-moderator, Matt Venhaus, we will introduce them um, one by one when we get to the panels. But let me say right up front, I am truly humbled um, to, to be standing here amidst so many technology entrepreneurs who have also figured out how to use their considerable talents in very practical ways for positive social change. They are not just inventing things, they are inventing things and putting them to work out there in tough, very tough environments. So I, I, I sincerely mean that. I'm humbled to be with you and I just thank you all for coming here today. Um, why are we all, why have we all come together? Well, we're all keenly interested in finding uh, new tools and technologies with which to manage conflict and promote peace building. That's what our Smart Tools for Smart Power series is all about here at USIP. And there is no more promising technology these days than mobile phones. Fifteen years ago, only 15 years ago, 50% of the world's population had never even made a phone call. And today, over 50% of the world's population are walking around with a mobile device. In a couple of years, we're all going to be walking around with a smartphone, essentially a mini computer in our pockets, even if in Afghanistan, clearly one of the poor in, poorest countries in the world by virtually any index, at least until they found the lithium, um, where and a country where mobile telephony is growing at an exponential rate, as we all know. But as the folks here at the front of the room, the world's leading innovators with cell phones, know better than most, it's not merely about giving people, giving more people, more phones or more features on those phones. The technology is really, really just part of the question, almost the easy part of the question. The bigger challenge is a, a very getting to a very clear identification of the problems that we need to be solved 
and those that can be solved using cutting-edge mobile telephony. Focusing on the right problem at the right time. That's the heart of innovation. And let me illustrate this. The really interesting story that I came across in the course of our research on this topic, and it's a true story about a very undisciplined young boy growing up in Ohio, and he was in school for only three months before he was thrown out as being unteachable. And his father decided that hard work and brute force were going to be the only things this kid ever understood. Now, his mom, as mothers tend to do, she continued to believe in him. She schooled him at home. But still, he gradually became known as a juvenile delinquent because he did things like walking into the local hardware store, picking up an expensive piece of equipment, and just walking out with it. So when he did that, a storekeeper demanded the boy be publicly thrashed in front of the store, and his father was happy to oblige. Now, this was a boy whose story none of us would probably remember now, except for something unusual that happened one night. The boy's mother had appendicitis. And shortly after sundown one evening, her appendix burst. And by the time the doctors arrived, they had to tell the boy and his father that because it was too dark, they would be unable to operate on her until the morning, by which time she would surely be dead. So the father sits there with his head in his hands. At the same time, the boy runs out of the house, goes back to the very same hardware store where he'd been punished before, and without hesitating, he breaks into the front window of the store, goes in, and steals $700 worth of merchandise. When the hardware store owner showed up at the boy's house the next day, He demanded another public beating from the boy's father, and he got one. But this time, the boy's father immediately knocked the store owner off of his feet rather than the boy. And then he returned to the store owner what the boy had stolen, $700 worth of mirrors, which the boy had used to reflect and focus the light of a single lantern enough to fill the room, which meant that two doctors could operate on the mother of Thomas Edison. Now, I know what you're thinking about that story. Thomas Edison was a scientific genius, but in fact, that's really the point. He wasn't. Um, Ask any scientist. He really only had one big scientific advance, vacuum tube in his whole career. The light bulb, in fact, had been invented by someone else and was already in use in Paris. Yet Edison became known as the best innovator in this country's history. And his innovation started not with blinding science or some whiz-bang new technology, but with a clear understanding of the problem that needed to be solved. He didn't focus on his mother's appendicitis like everybody else who was in the room. Her problem was darkness. He gave her light. So that's the image that I'd ask all of us in this room here today to be thinking about as we go through the morning. People innovating, generating ideas by better understanding the problems at hand. Each panel that we've got here has been carefully designed to have a combination of deep Afghanistan expertise as well as really valuable experience with mobile telephony, mobile phone-based solutions in other parts of the world. And we've configured the room in this rather unorthodox fashion because we want to try to get a good dialogue going among you all, among the experts here, so don't hold back, converse with one another, as well as a good dialogue with you out there. And we'll have times uh, that that we'll just go to the room and you'll have a chance to ask questions of the panelists. But these folks have really done it in in so many different ways with interesting solutions of complex challenges in difficult environments that we want to hear as much as possible from all of you here. And speaking of people identifying problems where mobile phones can make a valuable contribution, we are really lucky to have with us to kick the day off. We've got James Eberhardt, um, founder, chairman of that Denver-based company, Mobile Accord, Mobile Accord, and its associated mobile giving platform, MGive, are perhaps best known for their staggering fundraising efforts 
um, during one of the greatest natural disasters we've seen in a long time, the earthquake in Haiti. James started the Text Haiti to 90999 campaign we've all heard so much about. Many of us contributed to it ourselves. I know our whole family did. Um, the success of this platform has was really remarkable, even shocked James himself, I know, raised over $41 million within five days of the disaster, allowing over 2 million Americans to contribute to a cause that was meaningful to them. Um, unprecedented. But that success is hardly James's first. He dropped out of Colorado State University, and by the age of 26, he had sold his mobile ringtone business, Nine squared for 40 million bucks, thereabouts. That's what he tells us. It may have been a lot more. Now, I don't know what most of you were doing at the age of 26, but I can tell you my net worth was closer to kind of 40 bucks than 40 million. Um, in 2005, James began on a, a mission here to enable social good by building a comprehensive mobile platform, making it easy to leverage the power of the mobile phone for mobile banking and other services. Mobile Accord's mobile platform and systems currently allow mobile banking, crime and corruption reporting, SMS emergency alert and warning systems, mobile polling, mobile donations, and through these systems, at least four million transactions are being processed daily on multiple continents. So, to kick things off today, we've asked a true pioneer in the use of cell phones for peace building and development purposes to get us started. James really represents the kinds of resourcefulness that if we're, we need if we're going to turn our intuitions and our ideas about mobile platforms into real peace building outcomes. So let me ask James to take it away now. Thanks. Thank you, James. Sheldon. So when we start looking at mobile tools and smart tools for smart powers, you know, I think it's really important to actually look at the tool that we're working with and what we actually have to what we the inherent aspects of the phone. Um, you look at the ability to do data. You look at the ability to make and receive phone calls. Um, you look at the ability to grab location-based information. You look at the ability to do billing transactions. And you take this and you put it in a pocket, in the pocket of 4.6 billion people around the world. And you come together and you have the powers of the internet, you have the powers of real-time communication. And you have all these inherent tools that are right there with that person at that time. And you take back and you look back 250 years. And, you know, things were, you know, much different, but people still had the, the need to want to communicate to be able to gather, to be able to organize. And the way they went about it was a lot different. I mean, using the printing press to be able to give it, get a message, being able to organize in back rooms. Um, today, I mean, those types of things are actually done on Twitter, and you have a mass revolution come together in seconds from what took weeks, months, years to come together and organize movements is now done within seconds and done in such a mass scale that it's really hard to stop. So looking at the tools of the mobile phone and the, the powers of, that it lies in having the widespread reach of having two-thirds of the world with the mobile device is really a remarkable piece. And it's really, what does that tool do? And so looking here at the United States and you know, the tragedy that happened in Haiti and seeing what the phone can do, you know, looking at the power of posting an image, posting a... Homes, hospitals, and schools are destroyed. So from the time that Families Haiti searching occurred, for loved ones, the first, within trying the first to hours we had it up and live, and about two hours, do we're collectively we can help the American with the Red Cross Stan, and Al water and, and others from the U.S. State Department to, to take this message and put it out there. To and from there, you know, looking and at day five, we had five million dollars. Because of the generosity of the American people, uh, the State really Department set up a text messaging contribution system. Looking at day 12, we started seeing this social gathering where the first 
first text donation coming through on Twitter and then start carrying this social movement where you start seeing trucks like the one that will come up here in a second, you know, evolving, popping out of the woodwork, you know, people creating shirts. And the shirt that I'm wearing here was actually someone took it, wrote on the shirt and was walking around and going to TMZ and, you know, seeing this social gathering. I mean, people like Jimmy Buffett that, you know, you don't think of technology or Red Cross out there text delivering Haiti this message. To Red Cross number, which is 90999. Just text Haiti to 90999, and you'll be able to contribute $10. You can text the word Haiti to 90999. Just not really sure what's going on. You're like, and that will mean you've just donated $10. Am I right? It's that easy. If you text Haiti to 90999, but looking at this, I mean, seeing day one, you know, that money come through and start seeing this building, this social movement, and looking at this, and this is all representation of, and fundamentally we're able to change how people get, and seeing these images on the screen and being able to say, wow, this is a horrific thing that's happening. All these people that have died and are suffering hate, and being able to take out your phone and instantly right there, Give ten dollars, and what what we're talking about here isn't right something substantially different. Um, you know, for the longest time, people have you know taken a bucket out and put it out in front of someone and said, "Hey, give ten dollars to this cause." What we effectively did is took that bucket and put it across the nation and enabled two hundred ninety million people at a phone to be able to come out and give money right there. And you know, through this campaign, within the first first thirty days, we raised over forty one million dollars. Um, we account for 16% of the Red Cross's fundraising, and you know, just through a text message, something that two years ago in the U.S. didn't even exist. And so, looking at this, it's you know, what is this tool is this tool is enabled us to do? It's not changing what people are doing. People, you know, go out there and give, and really, it's making it easier, making it quicker, making that the viral networks, the social networks. And you know, seeing stories from you know an 80 year old guy that for his first time sent a text message to give a donation to Haiti. I mean, people that were th organizing, having parties around around the U.S. instead of paying a cover charge, you, whether you got in was showing your receipt confirmation on your phone that you gave into Haiti. And it really kind of speaks to that uh, that fundamental value of what you can do with social change and taking these tools and taking this powerful device that sits in your pocket. And how you can actually use that to impact, enact, and drive uh, drive a mechanism to engage people. Um, so when we start looking at you know what's going on around the rest of the world, I know we're here to talk about you know, specifically about Afghanistan. Um, you know, there's been so much that's been done, so much has been leveraged to take these you know, 4.6 billion phones and allow them to educate, allow them to give information, share information, and deliver that out in a real time mechanism. Um, you know, last year w with uh, AFPAC and Ashley Bomber and Vic Romstein, we launched out Hamaria Box. companies from Pakistan and the United States have joined together to launch a new technology service called Hamare Awaz, or Our Voice. This is a service you can use on your cell phone to distribute news stories to invite people to an event, to share your thoughts and opinions, to report problems that you see, to call for action to solve those problems. The United States is proud to support this kind of innovation by covering the costs of the first 24 million messages. And to find out how to use this new service, text the word HELP, H-E-L-P, or Madad, M A. DAD to the number 7111. That's help, H E L P, or Madonna. So, this, is, this announcement was made here October of la at the end of October of last year, um, roughly about eight months ago. And from this, um, I mean, from, from this, we enabled a social network. And a social network in Pakistan that you know, just created, we set it up, launched it out, the secretary gave the first mission, and from there, effectively, we were able to connect over a million people. Um, outside, it's almost going on eight months since the service has been up and going. We originally 
looked at, you know, for the first year, it take a while for the service to adapt and really make, a, make an impact and start connecting people. And we projected that we'd see about 24 million messages over the very first year. Um, in the first five weeks, we already surpassed that first year budget. Um, in you know, doing this, you know, in the first eight months, we connected over a million people all across Pakistan. We've delivered out over 300 million SMS messages. And this is something just coming from building this social network, putting it out there for people to use. And it's as simple as you know, sending a text message that you know, groups of as large as 50, 60,000 people that were connecting, coming together, sharing information. And you look at, you know, this is a, a text message that people are sending, passing, sharing information. And you kind of look at what the what fundamentally this has been able to accomplish. Um, you know, remote parts of Pakistan, there's a lot of people that have one information source in their local village that is able to give them, you know, give them their daily news, give them sports information, give them the current current events of, of what's going on. And you have this one voice that's the way they've always gotten their news, and then all of a sudden, now that they can connect and grab information from across the country, and what does that do? I mean, we we look at that this has takes a, an evolutionary step where people are grabbing their information from one federated source, and now having another source that comes across the country, you know, has the ability to you know, take and give information and keep people accountable. And you know, while People aren't going to change, and their belief patterns and the way they begin the information isn't going to change. And they get a text message saying that this happened, and they have their local leader say this happened. Most likely, they're going to continue on and believe what their local information source is. But when you start getting information, it may be a cricket score that you get, and then the local leader confirms that same cricket score that you just got on your phone. So they're saying, "Huh, okay, that's accurate." When you start getting information that doesn't doesn't coincide, you know. Most likely, they, they still look to the local leader as the one that's credible, but it starts creating this this idea and this thought process of who's really right, and starts driving that independent thought. And that's a powerful movement. That's a powerful idea is starting to come together and grabbing this real time information and be able to share it across mountain ranges across the country, and being able to get that information right there on your phone as simple as it may be. But we've empowered that and we've helped drive that forward, and you just start seeing all these things that are coming. Um, you know, from looking at, you know, a project in the Congo with the World Bank where we've effectively taken and partnered up with Vodacom. And so the thought process is that there's millions upon millions of people in the Congo that often don't have a voice. I mean, the wealthy elite, the government, NGOs are really the only people with a, a voice in the national in the, on the national stage. And so what we've enacted is an SMS system to allow people to take part and give feedback. And they answer a question on a weekly basis, and it could be as simple as, you know, what's the problems in your village? People reply back and say crime and tell a story about crime or poverty or water. And then taking that information in real time, filtering it and doing the analysis through an algorithm that puts up there and is able to map over top of a Google map and show what's going on from the collective voice of the people and taking these these millions of people and giving them a voice on the world stage to help bring that fourth pillar of NGOs, of government officials, of wealthy elite, and now having the people that are able to go out there and give their own independent voice. And it drives that power that, you know, someone that may have never stepped out of their local village but has access to a cell phone is now able to communicate and get that world, that message out to the world and have their voice heard. And it, you know, it goes into, you know, what's what's out there. I mean, enabling local people, empowering them. Um, looking at, you know, um, M Health, which is something that you start looking at, you know, being able to get information over over a cell phone, maybe talking to a doctor or getting SMS alerts about when to take medicine, or being able to ask a question. And starting to look at, you know, in certain areas, there's uh, could be people start getting sick. Patterns start to start to evolve. And you start to see that in this in this area, people are coming up with all of the same sickness. And maybe you identify that the sickness is created off of a water source. Taking that information and then using the cell phone, using location-based technology to be able to deliver a message back to everybody there that says, be careful of water supply. It's been identified here that people are getting sick and, and doing this. You know, takes and is able to prevent and take the collective good, do the analysis on it, and deliver out that message. 
So, I mean, as, as we're looking today and as we're talking about Afghanistan and what, what smart tools, what technology, what, you know, some, uh, you know, amazing people up here that are working to bring things, things to the forefront, bring technologies to the forefront to empower and enable people. I think it's important to look at that tool, look at the technology, look at the ability, and realize what the opportunity is here. I mean, the opportunity is 4.6 billion phones out there in the world that have the connections to the world to be able to give people access to take a step forward, to know, to be informed, to be educated, to be serviced with medical care, and looking at that and how do we evolve that forward. So thank you. enough time to take one or two questions for uh, for James but you're you've set the bar just in the right place and you've told us about an exciting innovation with Humara was question comes up why aren't we doing Humara was in Afghanistan or something like it um, you just <laughs> well I, I think that we absolutely look to extend that into Afghanistan at some point is that the idea that's the absolutely the idea okay. you just Identify yourself and your organization. We have a microphone for you. Richard White, Hudson Institute. I think we'll get to this probably at some point, but isn't there an obvious problem with Afghanistan as a possible avenue for extending your business, the fact that the insurgents presumably are aware of the potential value of this kind of communication, particularly allowing the people to work with the government and identify where they are and, and so on. Aren't they going to – wouldn't the Taliban or other insurgents try and – do everything they can to destroy the the, the polls uh, and uh, cut off hands of people who have cell phones. Do anything they can really to disrupt it. And I assume that's something we'll talk about at some point. No, I mean absolutely. It's it's always a concern on on what's going to happen. I mean you, you have those same concerns whether you have the mobile phone there or not. I mean right now you have the Taliban that you know, tries to shut down towers and blows up towers if they're left on overnight. Um, you know, as you evolve technology and enable these tools, enable the communication, I mean, you're going to have people that are going to try to repress it back down. But empowering them with those pieces that you can get the collective good to know about what's going on, inform them, and organize them. I mean, you're giving them a tool to allow them to fight back, allow them to grab knowledge and share information. And, you know, you got to take steps forward on it. That's a great question and one that's going to come up right throughout the day, right, about Taliban and their um, uh, the, the threats, the security risks, and so forth. And we've got a heap of people on the front panel here that have experience. Anybody want to throw uh, – uh, anybody want to comment? We are going to be bringing it up throughout the day, but anybody have a, a direct response? Margaret just arrived back from Afghanistan last night. I just wanted to say that contextually I think we also need to remember – in Afghanistan, the literacy rate is 10 to 15 percent nationally, which means in the rural areas, a lot of people have no literacy, no education at all. And I think that's something very different from Pakistan. And the, you know, in the rural areas, a lot of people can't do SMS or can't send messages. So I think that's important to keep in mind also throughout. But on the, specifically on the security question, we're going to try to keep this lively up here. I'd like to address the security question. Um, I've been working in Afghanistan for. Uh, quite a few years, and it's a risky place. It's a war zone, and there will always be risks. And if we don't step up and take those risks or allow the Afghans that are choosing to take that risk, then we're actually impeding their progress. Um, you just have to accept risk and move forward. The only way to actually do this is overwhelming communications. I mean, what if there's a sniper? Then they can use the roads, and then we should tear up all the roads. No, overwhelming communications is the only way to counter oppression. All right, we're going to be coming back to this theme throughout the day. Anybody else? Another question, comment for James? Sorry. Go ahead, Shanor, who's also just in from Afghanistan yesterday and works at the largest, one of the largest telecom providers in the country, uh, Roshan. Shanor? I just uh, wanted to sort of reinforce the fact that there is an illiteracy problem. But I think that you have a very good point that the Taliban are using technology in a way that and so, you know, with the cell phone towers that were being bombed, we moved from a security model, as in having external guards guard our towers, to a community engagement model. So now the community guards our towers. 
we use solar power for them, we take the excess power to the community, and if our towers operate and we make a certain amount of revenue, they get a revenue share. Now you've empowered them. So, you know, during the election that just happened, 18 towers of ours were bought at a cost of $14 million. But when we moved to the community engagement program, we recouped $13 million of that. And there was one village where the tower was asked to be switched off and the community said no. And during that time, unfortunately, the um, village Shura's wife was due to give birth and uh, that birth went wrong. And the people came out and protested. So I think what you're seeing is the building blocks of that community empowerment. But we've got to be there behind the technologies and the models that we put forward. There's got to be that commitment to move forward. Excellent. So you hear we're going to have a lot of ground truth throughout the day. We've got people who really uh, work in this milieu every single day. Any other points for specifically for James so he can sit down? Any other questions right here in the front row? My name is James. I'm with the Internet Bar Organization. Um, I was just wondering, how do you um, view the sort of acceptance or dependence of these mobile technologies in comparison to, like, developed countries? Are they different? Are they becoming more dependent than perhaps we are? Well, I mean, you look at, like, the developing nations are often are looking to leapfrog us in terms of their adaption, their use of, of the phone. And it comes from a simple thing. Like, when we look at, like, uh, places around the world, like in the U.K., I mean, to get a, a, a landline phone for a business, you know, it takes months to get set up in a place where you can walk downstairs and set up a phone. You know, and driving that just off of the old infrastructure in Europe, I mean, it propelled Europe a lot further and faster than the United States in terms of their adoption. I mean, here you can have a phone turned on within a week easily at your home. And there's so many different choices because of our infrastructure so well built out. And when you look at, like, developing nations, you know, trying to set up and build a strong infrastructure when there's not a lot of money, you can take and put up a tower. And from that tower, you start empowering it with financial services, news and information, communications, um, health. I mean, there's amazing things that you can do just from placing that one tower and servicing people for kilometers, hundreds of kilometers, sorry, you know, 40, 60 kilometers around the base of that tower. And so in terms of how they adoption and how they, how they go, I mean, it's amazing to see the, the simple innovations in the Philippines. Um, you know, being able to place an order for McDonald's, have it delivered to your house through text message by texting, you know, one H, two, you know, F, and you know, having a large, a large hamburger and a fry delivered out, and it comes off of just, just need and necessity, and not having access to other things. So innovation absolutely is driven by need and, and access. It's good, Emrys, right behind you. Go. Last one. From right. Amida Associates, um, I was really in, in, interested in your example of Pakistan. I think that it's it's fascinating. And over the years I've been working, I can really see how that meets real needs that are there, and the and the issues of being able to discuss and debate in a way that's often very difficult. But I'm wondering how you actually arrived at that particular idea. What was the needs analysis? What was the understanding of what the issues were, which led you to that particular response? And also, how do you measure how effective it's actually going to be or is being at the moment beyond the actual numbers, which are incredibly impressive, and that's yeah. nearly two messages per, per person in Pakistan. It's incredible. Yeah. I mean, as we kind of assessed and, like, looked at it, and we looked at, you know, what can we do to drive information and just taking that whole principle of, you know, if people have the ability to receive multiple information sources um, digitally, how can we empower that and how can we enable it? Um, and looking at just really putting a tool out for communities to be able to go through and organize and you know, kind of seeing that it's the effect of you know, having students organize and, you know, get out and actually go out and do things, have people start advertising jobs um, and looking at, like, the use of it. And there's a lot of people advertising, promoting their businesses out. And so, you know, looking at just the fundamentals of what we thought, you know, was really like people start sharing news. And we didn't really see it growing that fast, but people qu quickly took that tool and saw Okay, I can advertise a job on here. I can promote a business. I can share information about local markets. And, you know, we, we didn't do any of that. I mean, we just put the, put the tool out there and, you know, serviced it with the wireless community. And 
the people really were the ones that developed it and used it and made it into what it is today. All right, last one before we go to our first panel. Yes, there's um, a microphone there if you just identify yourself. And Brad Brown, Afghan Digital. Um, Margaret, on the, pick up on a thread that I think is flowing here. I'd be interested in your comments. So it's certainly not a complete answer in any context, but with the literacy rate issues and the rapid adoption of cell phone technology, it's just kind of interesting that it teaches a lot of people how to count from one to nine and learning to text in short code messages for rudimentary communication is the pathway for people to learn to want to become literate. And I'm just wondering if you're seeing evidence of this in your experiences. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, we have a SMS-based system where farmers can retrieve market information in, in different markets throughout Afghanistan, and we'll talk about it later this afternoon. But we found that happens a lot, actually, or maybe the farmer doesn't know how to do it, but his son has gone to school and can show him. And, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. That that does happen. And I know that Shainor probably knows a lot more about that as well. James, do you have any? Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, but you want to add to that? Sure. I mean, absolutely. I mean, we, you know, just uh, looking at, like, yesterday, we, we uh, in the Congo, launched the polling. It was all done in French. And, you know, in the Congo, there's a number of different languages that are spoken. And so what we saw is, you know, the time it took for people to reply back and, you know, opt in to receive and be a part of the World Bank survey um, was, you know, over the course of a day or two. And they received the message. And what we kind of attribute to is, you know, in, in the U.S., you'd see that, that you'd see a lot of the people do it right there where they wouldn't do it at all. But when we looked at it is, you know, people got the message on the phone and then went to someone else and said, what does this mean? And being able to look at it and be enforced that you want to know and understand what the message is and using other people to help educate you and, you know, driving that need to know what it says, be a part of it, is driving people to actually start taking those fundamental steps forward towards, you know, self-education. All right. Thank you very much, James. We've really gotten us started on the right note, a man who has both been an innovator and really practical in, in, in his application of the, those innovations. All right, so let me now turn to our first panel and um, get us going on this topic of tackling corruption and improving governance. Um, in fact, in all of our panels today, we're going to try to answer a fairly simple question, which is to say, where are the opportunities? Where are the significant challenges? to the use of mobile phones for peace building in Afghanistan. What's being done right now? Where should we be headed? And what's keeping us from getting there? So on this first panel, <clears throat> we're looking how we can answer that question with regard to tackling corruption and improving governance. As far as our research is telling us, the, the potential of the cell phones to address those challenges have what we've seen is a lot of work in essentially three areas mobile banking to cut down on the ability of uh, officials and businesses to cook the books and, and take kickbacks and so forth. We've seen mobile phone systems that are giving ordinary systems a way to report on corruption and other crimes. And then we've been seeing mobile phones used uh, very interestingly with mixed results to monitor election, uh, monitor the elections last year. Um, to uh, map irregularities. Uh, so it was being done in mobile phones, crowdsourcing the information used in conjunction with mapping platforms like uh, Ushahidi. And we have got terrific people here that can speak to all three of these, as well as uh, a potentially new cutting edge use of mobile phones in the area of improving governance. And that is to say, resolving disputes over land peacefully. Yes, we are going to hear about how one group is um, uh, suggesting we use mobile phones in Afghanistan for long distance dis land dispute resolution. So let me quickly introduce our panel, and I do mean quickly because I think you all have, if you don't have them, their full bios are outside. So, I'm, and they really are too extensive for me to be going into great depth here. Um, I'm going to give you just the highlights. First, we are very fortunate to have Shanur Koja here, who flew in yesterday from Kabul, from Roshan, as I said earlier, one of the 
uh, Afghanistan's largest telecommunications companies and which has also done some of the most interesting things in Afghanistan of any private company in the way of corporate social responsibility. Telemedicine program, for example, microfinance, mobile banking, and a lot of it is thanks to this woman who is managing director of Roshan's corporate social responsibility department. So thank you for coming, Shinoi. We also have uh, Patrick Meyer. Where's Patrick? There's Patrick, one of the founders and pioneers of, of the now quite well-known Yushahidi, whose mobile-based crowdsourcing pl uh, platform was used first to monitor election violence in Kenya in 2007, and now is being used every time I turn around. It's being used <laughs> in places like Gaza, in India, in Afghanistan. It was even used here last year, or this year, in Washington, D.C., to kind of map the cleanup process going on during our winter infamous snowmageddon that we had here. So that was a surprise for me, but I guess we're now starting to think of Washington as another conflict zone. Um, Eric, we've got Eric Gunderson. There's Eric, uh, president co-founder of the very highly regarded Development Seed, whose innovative tools like managing news were also used to in the process of monitoring the elections in Afghanistan. Um, but Eric's, I think Eric's real claim to fame was his um, when he created a ringtone for the famous George Bush statement to the former head of FEMA uh, during the Katrina disaster, Michael Brown. I think that ringtone goes something like, Brownie, you're doing a heck of a job. Um, and then we have Ruha Devanison is the Vice President and Executive Director of the Internet Bar Organization, as well as head of the Silk Road Initiative, which is working in mobile banking, as well as on the cutting edge, as what I mentioned earlier, of land dispute resolution in Afghanistan. And then lastly on this panel, we've got Nick Lockwood there. Um, Nick is the Afghan Communications Advisor in the Helmand PRT, so also just back recently from the field, um, he works for the United Kingdom's Stabilization Unit, which is kind of a piece of DFID, a piece of the Foreign Commonwealth Office. Uh, it's the Stabilization Unit from the UK. So needless to say, he brings to us, again, a great deal of on-the-ground ex expertise. Also, having spent two years working out of the British Embassy in Kabul before that in support of counter-narcotics -nar and the rule of law. So a pretty amazing combination of Afghanistan and mobile phone expertise, and we are really delighted to have you all here. Thank you for coming, especially very long distances. So I'm going to ask Shainer to kick us off. Shainer, Nick, and then Ruha to answer from their vantage points and experience basically the same sets of questions. This is kind of the format for the day. We're going to have people who have been working deep in Afghanistan issues recently to set up, set up the discussion by telling us briefly, A, what have you seen in the way of using mobile phones to fight corruption or to promote good governance? Where do you see future opportunities? And what's holding us back? What are the obstacles? And the reason why we're asking that all three of them to speak to those questions, what are you seeing? Where are the obstacles to moving forward is because then the other members of the panel who have lots of expertise from other places will bring that expertise to bear. They will comment on some of the challenges they're hearing about. Maybe they'll have some, some useful experience to apply that will help us resolve some of these challenges. Maybe not, but at least we'll get their, their input. So, Shainer, having come the furthest, you should have the floor first. Excellent. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to start off just telling you a little bit about Roshan, a few important points so you can see the impact of mobile phones. Uh, Roshan is 51% owned by the Aga Khan Fund for Economic Development, which is part of the AKDN. So we are mandated for social and economic uh, development, but our for-profit arm has to be profitable. Before Roshan came to Afghanistan, there were very few landlines, about 10 to 15,000 landlines because of the very mined area and the war. And uh, there was one mobile network operator. Roshan has invested over the last five years $480 million in its infrastructure. 
But what's that resulted in? We've paid $200 million in tax. We represent 6% of the GDP of Afghanistan. We have 1,200 employees, of which 20% are women. We've created 30,000 indirect jobs. This is impact, yeah? Um, so, Roshan itself means light and hope. It was named by the people of Afghanistan. It covers 60% of the population, and it covers rural populations. It has the largest coverage map of all the telco operators has 4 million customers, and collectively the telcos reach 7 million-plus subscribers. Let me tell you a little bit about Afghanistan now. It's a population of 32 million people. 50% of the population is under the age of 15 years old. The GDP is $350. Uh, The average life expectancy is 44 years. There are 17 to 20 banks. 38 ATMs, all the banks put together can reach 2.2 million people around Afghanistan. So, and I think an important point to note as well is because of this lack of infrastructure, the largest bank in Afghanistan has a million customers and is capitalized at $1 billion. And then the second largest bank has 80,000 Customers and is capitalized at 5 million. So this is just to show you that what happens if a large bank collapses? What does that do to the country's economy? It's just a thought to questions afterwards. And so amongst a number of technologies that we've brought for Afghanistan, uh, like telemedicine and voice SMS, that's how we get around the ability of people not to be able to read and write, We brought in voice recognition technology so you can speak your text message, gets converted to a text data packet and gets sent, and then it's reconverted into voice. So these are some of the constraints that um, we have to live with day to day. But what I'm going to talk about today in terms of corruption uh, and helping spur the economy and the development process is mobile money, because uh, I think it's a really critical build in the infrastructure that can really help progress the country into the 21st century, and it would be very good and cost-effective use of mobile technology. So today, we have launched m We launched it two years ago. It's uh, a partnership with Vodafone from the U.K., And basically what this technology does is it allows you to send money from point A to point B. That can be from an employer to an employee, from an employee to their family. It allows them to withdraw money, deposit money, pay their electricity bill, and we've just started the ability to buy certain groceries using your mobile phone, using e-currency. And it's being encouraged because you take away the cost of transporting money and the security and the risk. And so the supermarkets are actually giving a 10% discount if you pay with e-currency. So what has happened since we launched this? We launched it, and uh, what we found is that about 20 private companies signed up with us to have their payroll, payroll deployed, dispersed through this system. What it means is that with one click, with one click, 1,200 employees or 500 employees all get paid their salary. You no longer need a security vehicle to go and pick up the money from the bank, drive it to your office, lock it in a safe, count it into piles, and then have employees walk in and out and have their cash given out. Because this was successful, we were asked by the Ministry of Interior to help with the payment of police. And so, not an area that we would have ventured into, but in an effort to assist the process, we actually did a trial with 50 police officers in Jalrez. The first thing that happened, the first month that we paid, uh, the police officers, you know, all phoned up the call center and said, oh, we haven't got paid because they didn't understand the system. So herein is one constraint. It takes a lot of training, a lot of explaining, 
uh, a lot of reinforcement of what the technology is and how people acknowledge receipt and what they can do with it. So that's a cost. That's a limiting factor. The second month, everybody phoned, well, 30 of the 50 phoned and said, oh, my gosh, we've got a pay rise. The U.S. government is paying us 30% more than we ever got. They didn't know what they were getting paid because there was so much skimming off. And we also had a situation where, um, not to name any names, but we had a commander turn up at one of our agents' offices with 45 SIM cards and say, give me the cash, right? (laughs) And I'll I'll send it on. So you can see how this transparency and this speed uh, would affect change, right? And because you can transport money rurally, sorry, I'm beating up my fellow colleague, uh, because there are 234 cities, towns, and villages in which Roshan is, and if you add the banks, if you add the microfinance, if you add the Havalas, <coughs> which is the normal system of I give Eric 10 bucks and he gives Ruja 9 bucks, you know, that's how I get money to Ruja. If you add them all to the network, we have a nice urban and rural distribution system that can allow people to get liquidity rurally. Now, when you think about that and you think about the payroll of the police and other employees, government employees, all employees, if that full sum of money was getting out to rural villages, what would be the impact to the economy? I think that's a question that we all need to ask and answer and understand why such a system would be important. So, you know, what are the benefits in summary? Safety, effectiveness, efficiency, speed, correct salary payments, more time at work because you don't have to walk home three days to deliver your money, more retention of staff because, you know, when they go back, and they've paid money to go back and they can't come back to work because of security issues, you've lost an asset that you've invested in. And through mobile money, you see, it doesn't matter on the amount that's transferred. So you're providing financial inclusion to the very, very poor. Now, I'm not saying this is all rosy, because most families may not be able to afford two mobile phones. So there are limitations. But today you can get a mobile phone for $30 or less if you bought en masse. So it's not an insurmountable issue. But to build 500 banks across the country is going to take a very, very long time. Uh, The other really important thing, I think, to understand is that With the efficiency that the telco brings, you are now um, disrupting the ecosystem. What do I mean by that? Today, that massive payroll is managed by the banks, by one bank. In the time it takes to transfer those funds, there is a certain period of time where interest is earned. If you multiply that by 12 months, that's a certain amount of income that may be displaced. If you could transfer the money immediately, that takes away that. With a mobile phone, in order to get a SIM card, you have to follow KYC rules. These are rules that require you to have a picture, a thumbprint, uh, you know, fixed abode, even if it is at the corner of Shash Darak and Pula Mahmood roundabout, (laughs) as opposed to number eight or something. And so you cannot have ghost accounts. Through GPRS technology, you can see that the people that you are paying are actually real and moving around. So, you know, I I put this all out there to you, uh, really for discussion. There are issues around the cost of uh, training, of setting up expertise and centers. There's cost around hardware for Afghan organizations and government in order to do this. Right now it's done on bits of paper. You know, that all needs to be digitized. And then, of course, uh, you know, there's a very important um, point that the paymasters have to be on your side to effect change like this. But I think if you put money in the hands of the rural individual, if you develop an e-commerce 
rurally, you are going to get other value-added services happening and you are going to empower the person that makes very little, a hundred or a hundred and fifty dollars. So not wanting to take up too much time, I think um, I will end there. That's fantastic, Jenny. You're amazing the way you stayed to exactly 10 minutes. I should, before we go any further, let folks know I'm going to be signaling the one minute to panelists because we really want to have lots of good discussion across the experts here. So the presentations will be fairly limited, but you've got to start it on a great note. And I'm hearing the challenge around training, um, and, I, and I do think we need to come back to M-PESA because I understand there was some backlash from those officers who suddenly found their take being skimmed off the top, and I'd love to hear you. Um, part of this purpose of this meeting is to bust, bust some of the myths around um, and mobile phones in Afghanistan. And M-Pesa, there's a lot of mythology around M-Pesa. Yeah. But let me turn to Nick Lockwood, who's also been doing a very interesting program uh, in Afghanistan on the ground um, that has been getting at the governance and corruption issues. Nick? Thank you. Um, I, I'm not one of the mobile telephone innovators here. I can't really even use my iPhone. But, um, but we do use, we are using mobile telephony in uh, Helmand. In a, in a number of ways. Um, very quickly about Helmand. Um, it's really challenging. It, uh, if you're British, the unit of size is Scotland or Wales. I think Helmand is the size of West Virginia. Uh, it's probably like West, West Virginia in a number of other ways as well. It's got, a, <laughs> it's got a joke I don't really understand the context. <laughs> People laugh. Threaten me. Uh, it's got a population of 1.4 million, um, or up to 1.4 million. We don't really know. The uh, the vast majority of that population, 70% of it, um, are in the centre of the province, um, in between, in and in between, the two cities of Goreshk and Lashkar the provincial capital, um, and that's where there's mobile telephony. Um, provided by Roshan and AWCC. Um, if you move south of Lashkagar um, into the town of Garmsia, into the district of Garmsia, if you move west into the district of Marja, and if you move north of Goresh into Sangin Valley and into Musakala, uh, you don't have 24-hour mobile telephone coverage. And the reason why you don't is the Taliban quite clearly don't like it. And I always think it's worth remembering if you ask how important mobile telephony is, and if it really has a power or a use, the Taliban certainly think so. They attack uh, Roshan and AWCC staff, they kill them, they um, blow up their installations, um, and the security is very challenging. And, um, and there's no easy answers to it as well. Sometimes it's suggested that the military can protect the Roshan facilities in, or AWCC facilities in Helmand, and they probably can, they probably could. But you have to protect an entire network. It's not just what happens in Helmand, not just the security which you can provide for the Marine Expeditionary Force or the British Task Force. It's what happens, it's all their staff across the whole country, it's the whole network. These are vulnerable, and you can't necessarily guarantee that security. So we don't have mobile telephony everywhere, um, but we have it in the centre. We've got about 70% with it. Um, we have problems with literacy, like uh, the rest of the country. Um, the rates I have is um, we've got a, a men over the age of 25, 20% literacy rate. Um, women over the age of 25, 11% literacy rate. And I think that compares with averages of 35% and 13%. Um, but um, I can't prove the validity of those figures. Uh, that's the kind of context. The problem we've got is we want to create a relationship between the Afghan government at the provincial level and its population. Um, a relationship which hasn't really existed before and a relationship which we have to enable them to create themselves. Um, and in a provincial reconstruction team, you know, we don't want to do things ourselves. We want to enable the Afghans to do it um, financially or with skills whatever way we can. Um, and there's a couple of things we want to do when we create that relationship. We actually want to give a sense of ownership of, of, of the government and, and a demand 
And there's a, a couple of very... And, sorry, and there's a third thing, which is very important. It, our answers can't be too clever. Whatever we do has to be... We don't have a lot of time, um, and we don't have a lot of bandwidth. I've, we've got, I've got three officials I can work with uh, in the province who um, will implement any kind of project like this. And they've got an awful lot of other things to do as well. And they... Um, they're not te technologically literate. Our, 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 our bandwidth is very limited to do anything. So sophisticated ideas probably don't work. Complicated ideas probably don't work. Um, and the two examples of use of mobile telephony, which I'll very quickly describe to you, they're really simple. I'm not suggesting these are rocket science or anything clever. Uh, the first is that one about the relationship with with the people in its government in a very direct way. Um, the most easily used means of communication is, is radio in terms of broadcast. And the FM footprint pretty much matches the mobile telephony footprint for pretty similar reasons um, in the province. So you, we, you, most of the ministries have a provincial director or deputy director represented in the provincial capital. And I think in two or three districts you'll find... Uh, district agriculture, health and education officials. It's very hard for them to move around. Um, when I move around I have helicopters and lots of men with guns and armoured vehicles and it's relatively safe. But officials and I, I still can't move that readily. Uh, if you're an Afghan official it's much harder. Um, so it's very difficult for them to go and use their traditional means of communicating. It's very difficult for them to go and meet people and to talk. Mobile telephony enables that to be different. So we have set times. It'll be education week. And the provincial education director goes on the radio. It's advertised in advance, and people phone him up. Um, the education ones are easy. It's interesting when you put district or provincial police chiefs on the radio. People scream at them. They uh, get massive interest uh, from people wanting to discuss the behaviour of the police. Um, this touches on something which is really important. It's about if you can do all this, but it's what happens next. We have had an example, though. We had so embarrassed was a, a, a provincial police official by having been put on the radio and listening to complaint after complaint about the behaviour of a particular police unit in a particular area that um, he actually went and did something about it. Now, did something about it for three weeks. I don't know what the long-lasting effect of that necessarily would be, but um, it certainly is some form of response. Um, and it creates a demand. Uh, another one is a, a very, very simple thing, which is a kind of crime stoppers. There's no, you know, it's, it's a 911, a 999 line. Um, people can phone up when they see things they don't like. And, and this isn't meant to, this isn't a sort of an intelligence line or a, a you know, an informant snitch line. This is, this is sort of traditional community policing. This is phoning up when you think something bad's happening or you need help in some way. Um, it takes about a thousand calls a week. Uh, the problem we have is the, literally the infrastructure. We rely on somebody answering the phone. It's got one line. So when somebody else phones, if somebody's, if somebody's already on the phone, it goes to an answer phone. It's not the greatest way of doing it, but we're changing that. <coughs> we're now going to have a modern exchange with ten different lines. We still have to have people to answer the telephone, and once the phone's been answered, we still have to then do something about it. Um, when I was first discussing this with Sheldon, he sort of asked me the question, but don't you raise expectations by potentially doing this? Um, and I've been struggling about my answer to that. And I think my answer to that would be, yeah, we do. But and Afghan governance and Afghan responses, you know, at a provincial level, to a typical province like Helmand, they're, they're bad. Yeah, they're not what we'd like them to be. But um, we have to try. Um, I think that's probably, that's not a mobile tele telephone issue, that's a Afghan governance issue. Um, that's probably enough for me yeah. for now. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Nick. <laughs> All right. Our last uh, uh, panelist who's got some very specific <clears throat> Afghanistan experience and ideas here is um, uh, Ruha, and she's going to tell us how you are thinking about using mobile phones in this area, and then we're going to open it up for discussion on the panel. Ruha? Sure. Um, and I have... Your clicker, if you... Oh, yeah. Useful. Uh, there's a couple slides she wants to show us. She's 
You're welcome. So I'm with the uh, the Internet Bar Organization, and what we do is we try and use find ways to use technology to bring rule of law to developing countries in, in various ways. Uh, the Internet Silk Road Initiative is our initiative for Afghanistan, and we look into the use of technology through mobile phones. And I'm having trouble with, there we go. Uh-oh. Uh, just be patient. Through mobile phones to tackle um, land rights clarification, mobile banking, mobile commerce. Um, I'll leave the, the mobile banking discussion to Shaynor and focus on land for today. And um, what we basically are trying to tackle is a very complex land situation that has evolved with 30 years of conflict, a lot of refugee coming and going, millions of people leaving Afghanistan, going into neighboring countries, returning in the past few years to find that their homes and their land has been taken over by other people. Uh, you're also dealing with conflicts between agriculturalists and pastoralists over the use of land. There's also a huge inaccessibility to the judicial system for rural dwellers. And just to put it in context, about 80% of Afghans use the land for their livelihoods. So that's 80% of people who feel they don't have access to the judicial system. Corruption is something that is dealt with on all levels of government, not to say that all government officials are corrupt, but bribery tends to be the norm. Um, there is, especially on the lower levels, a lot of strong arming of local officials by the Taliban. And so it makes it very difficult to approach uh, your local government official with a land dispute when you know that you're putting yourself at risk, first of all, by approaching them um, with, with the community warlords. And people, therefore, tend to try and resolve issues by themselves. This is the current state of, <laughs> of, the, of the land deeds. So any improvement, I think, is an improvement. Um, there are many efforts to digitize land records, which currently, I believe, just consist of taking photos uh, or scanning these deeds. Um, what we propose is just going going over some of the negative effects for people who aren't familiar with land issues. If you don't know who owns a particular piece of land, <clears throat> uh, that person may be able to occupy that land, but they cannot get a loan based on that land. It becomes hard to buy and sell land. Uh, you have disputes evolving over pieces of land, which can then lead to violent conflicts, and this has become not has become, it has been an issue for for the last 10, 20 years. Uh, conflicts not only with, within communities, but between communities. And foreign investors uh, feel unsafe investing. This becomes particularly pertinent with the discovery of trillion dollars worth of lithium. Um, it would be useful for people to prove ownership of that land before they have to sell it off to whoever's coming in for that lithium. Um, try to go to the next slide. So there have been several attempts to rectify these issues by the government, by community elders in the forms of uh, jirga sessions. A jirga is basically an, uh, a gathering of community el elders to re resolve disputes on an informal level. Um, and one of the problems with land has been that jirgas may resolve disputes and the people may go home feeling like they've settled something, but that resolution doesn't get transmitted back to the central government. So central deeds and central repositories of deeds don't reflect the actual situation on the ground. So what we propose, and we haven't yet done the needs assessment or the pilot projects yet, this is basically an idea to bounce off all of you for your opinion, 
is to train Afghans in using simple mobile technologies to collect evidence, first of all, on how Jirga has resolved these disputes, to, to gain some knowledge about how it's done on a community level, to help in mapping disputes. We know, and we'll hear from Ushahidi <clears throat> and uh, the people from Frontline at SMS, that geographical mapping of disasters is already taking place with mobile phones. We also have heard about the use of SMS texting to crowdsource information. So all of these technologies already exist. It's just a matter of applying them to a new field, which is land disputes. Um, you can detect new disputes and then SMS them back to a central um, alternative dispute resolution center, which could then send out ADR uh, ADR arbitrators or mediators to resolve disputes and then SMS back the decision to a central repository. Um, this, this slide talks about why mobile phones, and you've heard already about the ubiquity of mobile phones in Afghanistan. It's something that's accessible. It's something that when people feel they have a need, they'll learn how to use them. Um, and our particular model doesn't depend on every individual being able to use a mobile phone to map their land. It's more of a, what's called bounded crowdsourcing, where you select certain people to train to go out into the communities and use simple mobile technologies to transmit information back. Um, so you can't really see any of the text on this slide, and Sheldon warned me about this, but uh, <laughs> I'll just describe it for you. Um, it, it's a very simple idea to use you've already got the ability to take satellite images of land. But with satellite images, you, don't, you can't see who owns what. So uh, we would be sending people in with a satellite map who could then go from plot to plot and use a mobile phone to send up GPS co coordinates, to send up photographs of boundary markers, to uh, send SMSs with written descriptions of boundary markers back to a central registry so that the file on that particular piece of land now has several layers of information attached to it. In terms of um, resolving disputes, at this stage, um, basically what we would be doing is sending people in who have been trained in a combination of formal uh, Sharia law, statutory law, and in basic dispute resolution mechanisms that are used across jirgas in different communities. So we'd be sending dispute resolution arbitrators into communities when we find there's a dispute, have them settle the dispute with the various parties, and SMS whatever settlement is reached back to a central registry, again, updating the formal registry so that there's a link between informal resolutions on the ground and, and the formal de repository. Um, the main issues that people have with the central government when it comes to land is that they don't feel like there's any accountability. They don't feel like there's any transparency. They feel like it's a security threat to approach the central government because, first of all, you're your dispute's probably not going to get resolved. It's probably going to get tied up in bureaucracy. And you've just pointed yourself out to whatever um, warlords in the area have interest over that land, and you've said, oh, hey, here I am. I'm disputing your occup occupation of my land. So um, something that mobile technologies provide <coughs> are transparent transparency in the sense that once you have a central repository of information, digital footprints can be tracked in who's accessing that information, who's changing it. When you have deeds in paper form, like that photograph that was just so shown, anyone can walk into that office and, and change those. And I've seen photos of a deed with literally scribbled out, you know, parts that are scribbled out and written over. There's no signature attached to that writing over. It's just several changes made by who knows whom. So it provides transparency in that sense. It also allows, uh, and this is more of a future application, it would allow the public to access an online registry through their mobile phones. And this is something, this is where we would like to be in the future. Um, in terms of security, SMSing may not be encryptable, but once you SMS it back to a centralized server, that information is encrypted. It's also harder to intercept 
uh, an SMS text message than it is to intercept someone carrying a piece of paper. Um, so, as just to summarize what I've talked about, these are the ways in which mobile technologies can help now. They help in gathering evidence and they help in transmitting evidence more efficiently and more securely back to a central location. How can they help in the future? Um, we foresee more of a two-way interaction <coughs> between individuals and a centralized government, which would increase, govern increase um, accountability, increase transparency, and make people feel more empowered. And um, that's, that's basically it. We plan on partnering with uh, experts in online dispute resolution, one of whom is sitting right here, Daniel Rainey, uh, experts in cell phone mapping. Um, especially important is local partners on the ground, and we've reached out to several um, GIS, GPS specialists. We've reached out to the Afghan Bar Association and several universities and have had very positive feedback from all of them. So it's an exciting opportunity, and I'd like to hear from all of you your thoughts on it. Before you finish, Ra, mm -hmm. why aren't you doing this already? In other words, this is readily available <laughs> technology. You're mapping boundaries, be able to mm -hmm. archive the, the settlements. Um, why aren't you doing it? Is it a resource question? Because we've got lots of folks here from the U.S. government. Yeah. What is it? <laughs> it? It's, yeah. Yes, it is. Give us yeah. money. No. <laughs> um, what are the big obstacles? One obstacle is, um, is finding funding for it, and that's the stage we're at. We, we have done a lot of research and a lot of planning. Uh, the next step is to go to Afghanistan, reach out to partners on the ground, and to to gain the funding to do that and to run these pilot projects because we're using such simple technologies that have been tested and proved in other areas, as, as everyone else will talk about on these panels, it's not really that huge a leap of faith. The leap of faith comes with the more difficult questions of people-to-people -people interactions. How are you going to resolve disputes on land? You know, you may, you may have mobile technology to transmit the resolution, but if you don't have a resolution, then that's a problem. And that's what we're working on in terms of coming up with a new system that combines traditional and formal mechanisms. All right, we've got lots of people with lots of interest in the three presentations we've already had. Let me quickly go first to Patrick Meyer and Eric Gunderson. Uh, you guys have some comments uh, as the discussions of what you've heard given your experience. Lots of efforts here to create transparency around land records, uh, around um, uh, banking and the movement of money, and certainly, Patrick and Eric, your various efforts at mapping technologies using data from the ground have a lot to do with creating transparency. That's one of their big strengths. What are your thoughts on what you've been hearing? Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Sheldon. So, I mean, disclaimer, first of all, I'm not a, an Afghanistan expert, yep. and so I'm going to be drawing from uh, a number of uh, different examples. And I should state as well, Ushidi is a, a nonprofit tech company, so we don't, we don't implement. So the stories or narratives that I'm going to share are from other organizations that have used this platform. And basically, all Ushidi is is a platform that allows you to map information in interesting ways. It's definitely not a methodology. There's a lot of confusion sometimes that happens that people think that Ushid is a crowdsourcing methodology. No, it's just a platform. The way you collect your information is up to you, whether you use crowdsourcing, representative sampling. It doesn't really matter. Ushid does not come there. Ushid comes when you've collected the data already, and then you're mapping it. So it's been used in interesting, um, in interesting ways. Um, in terms of you know, different governance areas from uh, corruption monitoring and the new program that Transparency International and other groups are using in Panama for corruption monitoring. In Liberia, there's been interest by the Norwegian Refugee Council to use Ushahidi, meaning using mobile phones and other technologies to report information and map that information for uh, land disputes. Also, local governance was a new initiative or a couple of months ago in India to do use Ushahidi for local governance uh, type issues, transparency and accountability. Uh, it looks like this is what's going to happen with the Haiti deployment in um, Port-au-Prince. And then, of course, uh, elections. Uh, Sudan was uh, the first example of Ushahidi being used in a non-permissive environment. 
it got shut down by the Sudanese government for a couple of days and came back up. So that was an interesting um, uh, initiative by local uh, civil society groups. So I should say that the vast majority of the times that UCD is being used is by independent civil society groups. So in the case of election monitoring or citizen monitoring, whichever way you want to call it, it's not external international observers who come into the country, but it is actually folks on the ground. In Afghanistan, I was talking to colleagues of ours who um, implemented Ushahidi in Afghanistan, and I didn't actually know much about it, uh, so I, I asked a bit, and it's quite interesting. I didn't realize that they had set up five or six different frontline SMS installs. So they had five or six different numbers that people could actually text to, and that one of those numbers um, sort of became the source of some conspiracy and misinformation. People were saying, starting to say, oh, that number's um, monitored by the government. You shouldn't, you shouldn't use it, what have you. But they had five others. So this idea of sort of overwhelming communications, like you were saying, Dave, I think definitely uh, resonates. Another thing to point out is they still had to uh, use some satellite technology. So they did, still had to pay some between five to $10,000 in addition. So it's not automatic. It's not just using Ushi out of the box. Sometimes in these... Uh, challenging environments, you, you do need to have other technologies to help you do um, what you want to do. And also, it was not open crowdsourcing, but it was a bounded crowdsourcing approach. And what uh, my colleagues were telling me was really important that they had this Pajwak uh, news on the ground. There were the folks who actually did the monitoring. There were about 30 people who were trained to do that, and they went to the different polling stations, and they would report on what they saw. And again, it was you know independent. Um, what really surprised me was when they told me that they actually launched a project two weeks before the elections. This is something that I actually actively discouraged to do from different partners who approach us and say, we want to use Ushahidi for election monitoring in Guinea with just a few weeks ago. So it's pretty impressive that they were still able to uh, pull that off um, in such a short period of time. I think finally what I would say is, um, you know, in terms of learning, Ushahidi is still a very, you know, a new right platform and I think a lot of people are still trying out the platform and so when you have the case of Afghanistan or in the Sudan um, sometimes it's even more symbolic than anything else right the idea that an independent Sudanese civil society group would go and use cell phones and SMS to monitor independently of the government and established formal institutions like NDI and the Carter Center to do their own thing is kind of revolutionary in my mind and certainly in, in their minds as well. And I think, you know, I don't have, I've been trying to think about an analogy. It's still a very new technology. It's not like the Wright brothers created the 747 right away, right? They, they, most of what they did was failures, failures and failures and failures. Are we going to say that the Wright brothers were complete failures? No, they were pioneers in the sort of era of flight and so on. So I think what we've been able to do based on these different applications of Ushidi is learn a lot and share a lot of uh, that learning. That's all I have to say from the Ushahidi, and I can definitely answer questions, and I'm really learning a lot in Afghanistan. It's very important because we do have partners that are looking to use Ushahidi in Zimbabwe, in Iran, in Burma, and so this is really helpful. Eric, thought to add? Yeah. Um, again, Eric Gunnison from the Development Seed. We're, we're actually a, a strategic tech par partner for international development organizations, so like, like Patrick. Um, we're, we're not actually running, running some of these programs. Uh, we're coming in and helping uh, deliver the ball bearings that are going to power some of those. Uh, and, and on the governance side, I'm, so I'm, I'm here today to talk more about our partnership with National Democratic Institute uh, around the, the election uh, that happened, uh, the presidential election in September of, of, of last year. And, and like the rest of the panelists, uh, uh, there, there are some interesting struggles when you're actually actually working working on the ground. Um, so our, our expertise is in is in large data sets. So with uh, what we ended up doing with with NDI was in uh, in, in in the end of August. Uh, there quickly so the election was uh, was August 20th. So uh, towards the end of August, it quickly started looking like the data was weird. Um, and they weren't sure what was what was coming in. Uh, we, we were brought in to, to actually look at some of the some of what the Independent Election Commission uh, started started releasing, and uh, some some really basic requirements uh, came up. And these basic requirements uh, were about hey, who's who, who was voting for who, who, where? How, how can how can we better better visualize it? Uh, and. And we ended up working with NDI to actually uh, parse out and, uh, and and strip all the PDFs 
that the uh, Independent Election Commission was, was releasing and make a private intranet uh, site to allow NDI's team in Kabul uh, and their team back in, in D.C. to actually visualize, uh, visualize uh, a combination of uh, a combination of voting returns and and also running certain fraud criteria over those terms. Um, and uh, anybody anybody with a laptop out there right now can actually go and and see a portion of the site that uh, NDI has made public to help uh, for capacity building in the in the run up to uh, to this uh, Walesi Jirga uh, election. It's AfghanistanElectionData.org. And w- so what we ended up doing here was we wanted to be able to quickly quickly drill down and, and take this 2,500-page PDF that Karzai uh, uh, got uh, 54, uh, 54% and uh, be able to say, wait, l- l- let me actually look at this data now on a province uh, basis. Uh, let me actually look at uh, 600, uh, 600 uh, ballot submissions per polling center, which was 100% uh, ballot submissions. Let's actually quickly start graphing that. Let's quickly now drill down to a district level. Uh, on, th- again, this, this, is a, this was made as a private site for uh, for NDI's team. These were some of the best election uh, experts in the world. It does not necessarily mean uh, they're experts in all of Afghanistan's uh, 400 districts. So we started pulling in other open data sets uh, for, like uh, literacy rate, percent urban and rural, um, population numbers, and, and really tried doing this <laughs> dynamic dashboard um, mashups. And what's been what's been interesting about this uh, th- this process was actually seeing how how bad the data is in, in Afghanistan. Um, you, you would quickly see discrepancies between estimated voter turnout uh, and, and population, of course, because like the, the, we won't even go there with, the, with this crowd. Um, we, we were very fortunate um, that we that we were able to map, and this is the actual hook into the to the mobile side. We didn't do anything with uh, with, with all the mobile data that was actually happening around the election. Um, I mean, the the the, the texting in. Uh, for these mobile, you know, t- texting in and, and putting 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 dots on the map in, in the case of Afghanistan had such a limited sample that it was it was almost like uh, you know a, a visualization for a, a talk show uh, site. You know, it, um, what we were trying to do was actually take existing open data sets and 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 visualize uh, much more, much more official official data. It's just a totally different user case scenario, right? It's not, it's not about giving people a voice or anything. It's, it's really allowing, um, it's really a very wonky user story of taking very dense data sets and, and allowing people to try to play with it that otherwise haven't. Um, so le- turning, turning the corner from the actual project, uh, what, what this um, has potentially, uh, what, what this could be interesting for people in the room. Uh, all of these tools that we're doing are made with open source uh, software. So uh, uh, the actual Afghanistan election data site is powered by Managing News, which is an aggregator, uh, much like Ushahidi. You're able to suck in uh, suck in RSS feeds or XML feeds or parsed out uh, PDF data and uh, quickly map it and start being able to, to drill down on it. You're also able to use tools like Slingshot SMS, which is also all open source, and be able to uh, send send text messages uh, into it. Again, like we're, we're ball bearing people, right? We, we make some of the underlying found, uh, uh, software software that, that, that is the foundation for some of these applications. Also, um, the, the maps that you'll see on, on this site can all be used for uh, some folks' mobile applications. Um, in, in this room, uh, we end up using a combination of uh, open data sets from OpenStreetMap, uh, which happened to, at the time, uh, have some of the, some of the better, uh, better road maps, uh, to working with Ames uh, to, to get political boundaries. And thank God they matched up with what the IEC uh, was saying. We had 400 uh, districts at the time of the election, uh, to also using SR TM data from NASA, which is the shuttle radar topography uh, mission, so we were able to make terrain maps. Uh, this was important for NDI uh, in, in the mission over there to actually uh, see in the run-up to, uh, to what, we, what we thought was going to be a runoff of where to deploy, uh, deploy folks. Um, all these maps, uh, NDI, uh, NDI is really big about trying to take these these maps that they've made from open data and turn them into like a, like a derivative work, nice map tiles that can be loaded in Google Maps or, or open layers. And actually put them online so other projects 
um, whether it's an Ushahidi site, and we worked with Ushahidi in Haiti where they were able to take some of our Haiti map tiles and drop them in um, and, and quickly start running with some of these maps. So this is only going to get more exciting. Uh, we're working with NDI again uh, this, uh, for, for this coming election, and the, the quality of maps um, we're, we're planning on doing is, uh, is, is especially exciting. Maps that are going to work, that are very light, that are very fast, that will work well in low bandwidth situations, maps that you're able to actually take offline with you, run on a US, USB drive and overlay your data. So it's, 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 it's wonderful to be um, up, on, up, on a, uh, up on a panel like this, um, especially on a, on, a, on a mobile panel from, from, past, from past experience, even, even, even more than uh, playing, with, playing with ringtones and more, more building things like, um, things like Slingshot. And, and working with uh, Katrine for a couple of years on Mobile Active, but what, what I'm what I'm excited to do today, whether whether it's through questions or or over, or over coffee, is actually talk about how people that are building uh, certain applications in Afghanistan can uh, start using using some of these maps and data and using some of these open source tools, and how we can really start um, capitalizing on 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 on, an, on on pooled investment. Actually, so let me just stop there. That's great. All right. Well, this is the time we're going to throw it out here for the uh, start on the panel. People I know have had, I've seen lots of nodding heads, lots of notes been made, uh, questions about what you have heard already. Shamamud, you had a point you wanted to start us, a little bit of ground truth about, I guess, what we heard from Shainor initially? or Okay, thank you very much. Uh, actually, this is a very good uh, initiative, you know, to start uh, this things and it has so many different dimensions. and. Uh, I wish we had the same kind of forum in Kabul, you know, to discuss more about these advantage, disadvantage of the technologies there, because if you just talk everything from here, maybe it doesn't solve that much uh, there. Next year, Kabul. Yes. And the second question is uh, dependency on technology. You know, in a country where is 50% uh, people is living under the poverty line, you know, if you just apply those sophisticated technologies, something's there, how it can be sustained in the long run, you know, in the country. Because some of these things, even not applied in the development, developed countries like the United States and others, you know, some things we are just talking about here. So this is another challenge is, uh, existing. Uh, but I'm not, I, what's called challenging, the advantage of technology because in enhancing knowledge uh, and also bring development and others. Uh, but this is a double-edged sword, you know, how you want to use it efficiently who use it efficiently, either the government of Afghanistan or the people of Afghanistan or international community or the Taliban use or the insurgents or the criminals, they use it more efficiently than us, you know. That is another issue because uh, we have to just, uh, I give you some examples specifically, uh, for example, like Bluetooth technology, you know. Bluetooth. They use it more efficiently. Last year I wrote a paper which was published in the Middle East Institute, you know. Uh, I translated those poems with the scene of activities, how the uh, Taliban attacked the international forces, they show the scenes of those activities there, and then they transfer to each other very easily, you know, because this was the same kind of a things like in the 80s, the Mujahideen were using uh, the local poetry, you know, songs and others to instigate people against the Soviet uh, there. Uh, sometimes this kind of the whole media things, you know, it created as a like public depression in Afghanistan, you know, because I just call it. The reason is that our international depression in many ways, you know, because we share a lot of information, but we have a new solution for that, you know. Or sometimes even, for example, uh, now if something is happening in my village in Kunar, I'm from there, so my mother just in Washington, she know more before than me because somebody called to her there, you know. It creates another anxiety, you know. If some incidents happen, some other things has happened, or the TVs we are just seeing here, uh, so these are all challenges was existing for corruption, for example. Uh, I was, uh, when I was in the ministry, you know, that because we just went from landline to the wireless and to all sophisticated things there, uh, this, what is called the CDMA, not the, the phone, which wireless phone, what is it called? JSM. JSM, yeah. So, which is have a range of cable. And so when I, every time when I was giving a call to that person, where are you? He said, I'm in the office, you know. But he was moving that phone with him in the car to his house. 
and use it there and we'll say, okay, I'm in the office, but he was not there, you know? We have to give you GPRS, then you'll know where yeah. he is. But, but the question is, you know, how uh, use the things, you know, I'm just saying is uh, how efficiently they use it, you know, for their own purpose. Or some of the people just take the government phones to their own house and how to use it, you know, for their own advantage in the offices. So there are so many other challenges also existing well, to this. I think... Shamud is teeing up a really, really key question here, and I'll go to you in a minute, which is, so we've heard about what you're doing in mobile banking. We've heard about what Nick's got the phone-in programs to local officials, and we've heard about, you know, the Crime Stoppers program. And all of these things, we've heard about the election monitoring. It was a very mixed picture, is what I'm hearing from Eric, very mixed success. But we know all of these things are taking place, are doable. The technology exists. And yet, fundamentally, correct me if I'm wrong, panelists, but the perception is that when, when it comes to improved governance and corruption in country, the perception is that with all of these great initiatives going on, we haven't really made much progress. And is that because of, do we have any solutions, ideas? Is it scale? Would be, would, would, should we be investing in just distributing wholesale phones to everyone? They're not that expensive compared to the you know, billions that we're spending in many. We did that in other war zones I've worked in. We distributed wind-up radios in different situations so people could have information. Should we be just wholesale distributing phones? Or is it something else? Is it time? We should be patient. We're going to get there. We have to figure it out as we go along. Or is it a new application, a new use of these things, like the one Ruha suggested? Are we been looking in the wrong place? Should we be looking at local land disputes as one of the keys here? Especially, you know, there's poppy fields, now there's lithium, all kinds of natural resources in country. Um, are we looking in the wrong place? I just throw that out to this extremely talented panel for discussion, and I know Ivan's been wanting to jump in here, and he's got a lot of experience in this area. So, Hi, Ivan, everyone. take it away. I'm Ivan Siegel. Um, I, I think a lot of this has to do – I mean, there's, I, I'm sort of wanting to answer a lot of uh, those assertions, so I'm going to throw one of them out there really quickly. There has been massive change and massive <laughs> success in the Afghan context in the last eight years. If you look at the communications infrastructure and human – and information infrastructure. There's no doubt about it. You went from a place with a country with one national broadcaster and a number of small newspapers and a, a tiny landline infrastructure to a country with four large cell phone providers, several hundred television and radio stations, satellite service, a population that is, has um, a redundant and resilient access to multiple sources of information. So the answer, in short, to that question is actually yes. An awful lot has happened. Um, but I think we have to be really careful, going back to Sheldon's first illustrated, illustrated point with Edison, of not confusing the tool for the end. Because cell phones are a tool, and we're going to have lots of examples of and anecdotes of good use and bad use, and as Patrick said, lots of mistakes on the way. Um, we have a basic question of program design when we come to something beyond the distribution and natural growth, or market growth of the use of the tools that we have in front of us. That basic idea, I think, is that technology is easy and people are hard. We have a lot of the technology, but how do we use it? How do we use it and towards what end? Are we clear about our own goals? Um, and if we start with that, that framework of, uh, for discussion, we'll find that um, it's really easy to play the kill the messenger game. So it's easy to say the, tech, the phone is at fault because my employer went, my, my employee went home from work and pretended he was there. Or you know, the phone is at fault because the Taliban have decided to, to, to target a tower. But I think that's a, that's a, a, mis, a mis, it's a mistake at a, at a kind of analytic level to, to, to start from that perspective. We're going to see lots and lots of anecdotes that look that way. And if we want to start to think about social change, we have to start looking at, in the way that Eric talks about, at larger data sets and, and, uh, and real learning over time. Where's the empiricism in this analysis, my point? Um, 
I could go on, but I think probably others want to, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Siddharth Raj. I work for the World Bank and uh, been working in Afghanistan for a couple of years now. Uh, and in fact, I just wanted to respond uh, to uh, Shah Mahmood Saab's uh, question about doing a panel like this in Afghanistan. I'm happy to let you know the World Bank uh, was there and did that. Uh, we actually, on Tuesday last week, uh, had a panel in Kabul, which included, of course, uh, members from the mobile network operators, the various ministries and the government, uh, as well as some of the private uh, IT firms in Afghanistan, uh, where we talked about how the government can mainstream mobile applications across its different programs and ministries. So I just wanted to put that out there. I'll be talking more about that later. But I just wanted to reassure you that we have had some very productive discussions with the various ministries and programs, and uh, I'll be happy to talk about that in more detail later. Uh, regarding the, uh, the, the, the point that the panelists just made, uh, I do want to, again, reinforce that very message, which is that the mobile phone is not the silver bullet. Uh, and one of the underlying questions that has come up in, uh, in the discussion so far is about what happens after the application. Okay, you collect $40 million for Haiti. How is it going to be distributed? What's going to happen on the ground? You, you make that phone call to complain about corruption. Is there someone who actually responds to it and creates the legitimacy and credibility behind that service? Or actually, does it become a way to blame the government for inaction again? So uh, it's, it's critical to have that second layer of uh, the backup, really, the back office. Uh, behind the application. And, and this is really the big problem we're struggling with, uh, especially in the context of the weak rule of law that does exist within Afghanistan. And, you know, in the Farsi Badla and the, the Pakto Badal, where you might report a corruption incident, but then somebody gets shot because of that. Uh, so these are real problems and questions and challenges. And I don't think that the mobile phone will solve them, but I do think it helps in certain ways, extending services out to the, to the, the, the people <coughs> where there were none, uh, maybe helping supervise programs better and so on. And, and just on that, maybe just in terms of practical um, uh, feedback, Ruha, for your, for your work, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure if, or how many of you here know this, but the government of Afghanistan, and actually the Ministry of Interior is the, the, the leader on this, uh, is embarking on the creation of a national electronic ID program and uh, this is, I think the pilot phase is going to begin very, very soon. Um, and this program is going to, for the first time, create a national registry electronically, uh, much removed from the Taskira, you know, paper with the photographs and all of that, uh, which will actually create a registry of citizens and then can probably be used for land records. And this is also a great window of opportunity uh, for the land records and land disputes resolution because of the $1 trillion that's lying under uh, the, the ground. Uh, there's going to be a lot of questions about rights of way and about land easements and so on. So I think it's a, it's a good opportunity, and I, I wish you the best of luck on that. Just the final uh, uh, reinforcement, maybe, of the point that even Shainur made and a couple of other uh, colleagues here have repeated, that um, the work that... I've been doing so far tells me that there are some users at the end who will uh, pick up the phone and dial a number or a short code or send a text message or so on. But not just in Afghanistan, but around the world, what's been realized is that the role of intermediaries is critical. Uh, you, uh, for example, there are agriculture information services that you can subscribe to in India. Uh, for a dollar and a half, you get a number of SMS messages and so on and so forth. The problem is that it's not enough to market this. You have to actually have people go to the farmer, sit down with the farmer, explain what this thing is, what it does for him or her, and, and get them to sign on. And this subscriber acquisition, uh, this education is, is really, really critical, without which you don't reach the kind of numbers that you, you would like to see. And the good thing about Afghanistan is that there are some intermediaries already there. There's the Community Development Councils, part of the NSP program. There's going to be village facilitators, which are part of the Rural Enterprise Development Program, and so on. So people exist there who could potentially do this for us. Now the question is how we mobilize them. And so I'll, I'll leave that question out there and, and turn it back to you. Thanks, Anand. Dave, Quinn, before oh, we go to the group. 
for the land deeds. I actually took those pictures in uh, 2006, and I was just back in the area talking to folks, and not much has actually changed from those documents. Um, there's a lot of reasons that some of this technology, um, I'd say one cautionary note is pick your problems and pick it from ground truth and actually go there and understand what the problems actually are before designing too much intricacy of the system that you're proposing to solve it, which, you know, frankly, from working in Afghanistan many years, I see this tends to be what happens over here. Um, and just to sort of solve that, I run a guest house in eastern Afghanistan. would be happy to put you up for you know, a few days, get you out about, go actually meet some of the people and get some ground truth. would love to have you out there. But really, going, it's a good idea. Land disputes are probably one of the you know, biggest causes of preventable violence that, in our region and, and several others. But it's a, it's a problem of complexity beyond what you can actually imagine once you get onto the ground. And so it, it could actually cause more conflict if not done intelligently. And so I would just say pick your shots. I do think it's something worth addressing. I think, you know, the, the dispute resolution is a critical problem. It, it's like doing brain surgery. You kind of got to know what you're doing before you go in. Hold on, we got folks here. Um, Adam, did you say you had a quick one? I do have a quick comment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, my name is Adam Kaplan. I work for USAID. I was involved in media development in Afghanistan, uh, 2003, 2004, 2005. Have recently gone back as part of my office, the Office of Transition Initiatives program um, in southern and eastern Afghanistan, now off and on for the last six months. Um, I'd like to make a comment uh, <clears throat> about the very notion of the mobile phone as something of a revolutionary um, device in, 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 in a social sh context in Afghanistan. Um, Afghanistan is a communal society. Um, people exist within the structures that they... Um, that are laid down by patriarchs and matriarchs, and you know your rank within that structure. What we've seen is in a specific community, namely Host, in uh, southeastern Afghanistan, that has a very large uh, population living in the Gulf, is that the ways in which that community has remittances from the Gulf return to it has radically changed the way that money is distributed in the society. Used to be that remittance came in by a letter, and more often than not, the recipient of that letter couldn't read it. So the letter was read communally. And everybody knew exactly how much that individual was receiving from the Gulf, and was expected to divvy up portions of that remittance to all of the various patronage relationships that he or she held. Now remittances come in individually to a person on their mobile phone. It's quiet, it's secret, and they decide how that money is spent on their own. They have an individuality that they never had before. That changes the way the society views itself. It changes traditional structures. It is revolutionary both for good and quite possibly to its own detriment. So I think we need to be cognizant of the impact that an individually owned device can have on a society that is not has traditionally not been focused on individual identity. So on the one hand, we're hearing it's not the silver bullet. On the other hand, we're hearing it's capable of transforming an entire way a society thinks operates. I want to make sure that we get at least one from the audience, and I want to make sure our online people get a quick question. But we are supposed to have taken a break at 10.45, and we are in danger of violating Geneva Conventions <laughs> if I don't let folks have a bye break. So I'll take one from the floor here, right here. Thank you. My name is George Dunlop. I'm the chairman of a company called Cobus Systems Corporation. We produce and service banking software. And also I serve on the board of directors of the Afghan American Chamber of Commerce. My question relates to the uh, relationship of mobile transfers of money. Um, the movement of money, even small amounts of money, 
uh, ends up under all kinds of banking regulations as being treated as an account. And accounts are very heavily regulated activities uh, all over the world. The banking laws of <coughs> virtually every country, including Afghanistan, but uh, every country in the world, the Basel Accords. And then the movement of money is further regulated by such things as the uh, Patriot Act, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, various money laundering laws. The, in Afghanistan, the uh, Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction uh, has to monitor payments and all these things. And so my question pertains to the degree to which uh, mobile transactions of money, the movement of money, can have a nexus with this very sophisticated set of protocols um, that uh, and procedures and practices that are required for the movement of money. Thank you. Um, basically, what the mobile phone does is it just provides the pipe. So, for example, the Roshan and Pesa account is a trust account. It doesn't earn interest on that account, and all the users are encouraged to move their money out. What the mobile phone company, what Roshan wants to do here is to integrate the banking system into the platform and to integrate other operators into the system so that basically everyone can transfer money, but as such, the accounts, the resting money would always be with the bank. Now, this has been in great discussion with various central banks uh, around the world where mobile money is occurring, but also with the Dar Afghan Bank, uh, the central bank of Afghanistan. <coughs> and the technologies today enable you to put parameters on accounts. So, for example, you can put down the number of transactions, the amount of transactions, you can track uh, simultaneous transactions from one number to another, you can geographically track them, uh, you can track through G GPRS, um, you have a double check with the bank account number and the, the SIM card number, so it becomes far more trackable than the system at the present time. So I think this is a, a very large myth that we really do need to address in terms of you're absolutely right. The banking system has huge regulation, and to accept deposits and hold them has regulation, rightly so, to protect the public. That is not the business that the cell phone companies want to get into. Our business is communication, connecting people, transferring from A to B, not holding cash or making interest. And I think that is often lost in this sort of uh, barrage of heads. And so I think a discussion like this is great because it clears up yeah, those sure. needs. Thanks, Sheila. Could I, could I make a quick Very comment? Very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, that's an excellent question, and, and uh, uh, Roshan's viewpoint is well known on this. Um, is it in, different in, from the World Bank viewpoint? <laughs> <laughs> Roshan's viewpoint is well known on this. Uh, uh, no, certainly this is, uh, you know, especially with the anti-money laundering and the consumer protection uh, considerations, it's important to put the right regulatory frameworks in place. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the Afghanistan Bank is working on this, and uh, is, uh, is we are hoping to see uh, some improvements uh, in the regulatory framework to the extent of clarifying it and putting in place uh, something that encourages innovation while protecting consumers uh, in order that we can start doing these kinds of money transfers for government subsidy payments, salary payments, and so on. So there is a, a lot of work going on here. Uh, and uh, again, I'll be happy to talk with you offline about that. But it's, it's encouraging at this point that we'll see something happen soon. All right, let's go to Anand Varghese. The last word from what are you, Anand, what are you hearing online or seeing online from those who are watching? And do they have any questions, a particularly good question for the panel? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of interesting discussion. I think a lot of people online are worried, uh, quite rightly so, about the security and traceability of people who are calling into st systems like Crime Stoppers. And they're wondering if maybe the answer is dis disposable phones or some other um, open source uh, version of encryption in t for text, text messages. Um, is there a quick answer to that? Or? It's a fundamental problem, right? Well, I don't think there is, actually, in that 
people don't seem to hesitate to ring um, too much. Um, the, the Crime Stoppers thing is not a, you know, snitch line. This isn't, you know, there's some Taliban men meeting in the fields behind my farm, bringing, you know, the Apaches and <laughs> them. It, 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 this, it's, it's much more a communal policing line. I, you forgive me for not being familiar. Other than 911, do you have a, a, a less urgent... Fine. It's more like that. <laughs> so the, 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 and some of the, some of the, you know, some of the calls aren't to, you know, yeah, people can report crimes, but it's much more. There's just no. There's the fundamental thing is that there's, people don't have a way of communicating with government. There's just no access to it. It's not like you can. You meet your ward councillor. There's just, or you can go to the office, particularly in a place like Helmand, which is a very big. There's not many officials, and travelling is dangerous. So, but it, it's a very simple access thing, and, and 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 it's interesting. A lot of the calls you get are really not policing matters at all. A lot of them are just a way of contacting government in some way. Well, that gonna, that's a very nice segue, actually, to our next panel yeah. on countering extremism, because that's one of the reasons why we've seen lots of. Phone-in programs have been established to radio, cell phone to phone-in to radio, where district officials are there answering questions. And, of course, the blowback from that is you can ask all the questions you want, but if nothing gets done, do you not do more harm than good? And on the next panel, we've got Adam who uh, for USAID, who has been uh, responsible working on some of those phone-in programs at the call-in level. So let's take a quick break. Come on back here literally in five minutes and get started again.